Good evening, friends. Glad you could join us. Welcome to our final events of Bible Prophecy Seminar. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tony, and I'm looking forward to sharing God's Word with you over the coming 10 lectures, 10 nights, dealing with the final events of Bible Prophecy. I want to encourage each one of you, if you possibly can, to come eat to each of the lectures. You will find that each of these lectures are going to tie one into the other. They all link into each other, building a big picture of what the final events of Bible prophecy are all about. You know, friends, as we look at our world today, we are finding in our world today there is like a collision of worldviews. We are finding many people asking many questions. Where is our world headed today? What is the future of mankind? Many have different concerns as they look at the world events. There are many concerned today about food shortages. They look at the world and they say, well, the population's growing so fast. How will the world support itself with food? Others are deeply concerned about the world economy. They find that things are taking place in the stock market, in the housing market, in the different countries and nations of our world. The world economy seems shaky, and many have the, the doomsday prediction that the world's economy will collapse. Others are concerned about the population explosion. Today, there are more than 100 million people being added to our population each year. And as time goes on, where are all these people going to live? Where are all these people going to fit into our world? Others are concerned about the environment that seems to be destroying, being destroyed right before our very eyes. Others are concerned about a nuclear holocaust, some concerned about an asteroid that may come from outer space and destroy the earth. Many are asking that question, what does the future hold? Many try to find answers to that question. Many go off to fortune tellers, mediums, gurus. Many go through the prophecies of Nostradamus as they try to find out what future events will be. But in my own life, as I've come through life, as I've studied things like Nostradamus and I've asked myself the question, what does the future hold? And I've been to the gurus. I've been to the fortune tellers. And what I have found in my own life is that many in our world today are looking for answers to these questions in all the wrong places. You know, many years ago when I was growing up, there was a song. It was called Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. You know, friends, today I think people are looking for answers in all the wrong places. I discovered in my own search to find out the question of what the future holds that the Bible, the good old Bible, God's Word, gives us the answers of where we've come from, why we are here, what the issues are in this world, and where you and I are going in the future. It answers the questions that mankind needs to have answered in their life of what is the future of mankind. God doesn't want us to be in the dark. The Bible has a lot more answers than most people realize. And God wants you and I to have those answers. He doesn't want us to be in the dark. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Amos, chapter 3 and verse 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. You know, friends, the Bible is the only religious book in the entire world that makes prophetic statements. And the reason why it does that is because God wants first to reveal himself to us. And he doesn't want you and I to be in the dark. God wants you and I to be able to base our faith on some substance. He doesn't want us to have a blind faith. And for, to do that, he's given us Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy gives us answers to what the future holds. So that when it comes to pass, you and I have more confidence to believe the word of God. The Lord God will do nothing, the Bible says, but he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Through the prophets, the ancient prophets of the, of the Bible times, God has revealed future events of the history of this world. You know, people will come to me and they'll say, Tony, how can you believe in the word of God? How can you believe the Bible is the word of God? And you know, friends, one reason why I believe the Bible is the word of God is because of Bible prophecy. Fulfilled Bible prophecy verifies the truthfulness of God's word and gives us confidence that the future is in his hands. When you and I see Bible prophecy being fulfilled before our eyes, we have a confidence that this word, this book, the Bible, is the word of God. We can test it by the claims 
that it makes. God doesn't want you and I to be in the dark, friends. God wants us to have understanding of future events. Now, in this series of lectures, we are going to be dealing with the final events of Bible prophecy. There's lots of Bible prophecy in the Word of God. We are dealing with the issues that are relating to you and I today. And our topic tonight is entitled, The Prophet's Code. You know, when most people pick up their Bibles... And they turn to prophetic portions of the scriptures. Most people cannot make heads or tails of what the Bible's talking about. I can remember when I first became a Christian about 20 years ago, my wife and I were traveling one day in our car. We just began to study the Bible. And my wife said to me, she said, when I was younger growing up, I read the Bible and there's some strange parts to the Bible. There's strange parts that people say they're prophetic. And it talks about beasts with horns and seven eyes and seven heads and all these different strange creatures. And I remember saying to my wife, I said, I said, honey, there's no place in the Bible that talks about beasts with horns and heads. And that's that's all weird stuff. There's no place in the Bible. And she said, there is. I'm sure there is. And she grabbed our Bible out of the glove box of of our car, began thumbing through the Bible, looking for this place where all these weird things were trying to prove that I was wrong and that she was right. Well, of course, she came across the book of Revelation. She came to the book of Revelation. She said, look, here it is. Here's a beast. It's got seven heads. It's got ten horns. It's got crowns on its horns. It's like a dragon. Here's another animal. It's a, it's a lamb. And it's got seven eyes and, and all these weird things. And I started thinking, well, what is all this about? I began to think to myself, well, maybe the Bible and Christianity isn't so right after all. But what I didn't realize and what most people don't realize when they begin to study the prophetic portions of the scriptures is that Bible prophecy is given in a symbolic code. Bible prophecy is given in signs and symbols and you and I have to decipher what those signs and symbols are to be able to understand what the Word of God is trying to teach us about future events. And to begin our program on the final events of Bible prophecy, I want to start by looking at a prophecy in the Bible that has predicted all the world empires from the ancient kingdom of Babylon right down to the day in which you and I are living. This prophecy tells us exactly where we are in the stream of time. And as we go through this prophecy, we're also going to find out how the signs and the symbols of the prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation work. Remember, it's given in signs and symbols. We decipher the signs and symbols and we understand what God's word is telling us. And our topic, the prophetic code, is really talking about, or revolves around an ancient king's dream. An ancient king's dream. And our story begins tonight way back in the ancient kingdom of Babylon. You see, friends, the ancient kingdom of Babylon, it was the world power in its day. It was a magnificent city. It was one of the most magnificent cities that's ever been built. In the ancient kingdom of Babylon, there were two of the seven wonders of the ancient world. There was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. I'm sure you've heard about the Hanging Gardens of of Babylon. And there was also the Walls of Babylon. The Walls of Babylon were so high and they were so thick that no army, no No force could penetrate into the kingdom of Babylon. They say that the walls were so thick they could race chariots around the tops of those walls side by side. Also in the city of Babylon, there was the great river Euphrates. It ran right through the middle of the city of Babylon, under the walls, through the city, and out the walls at the other side. Now at the height of the power of the kingdom of Babylon, there was a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king at the zenith of this kingdom's power. And the Bible tells us in the book of Daniel that King Nebuchadnezzar sent his armies down to Jerusalem and they besieged Jerusalem, the city of God. They eventually destroyed Jerusalem. They took the treasures, the gold, the silver back to Babylon and they took many of the captives of Jerusalem back to Babylon. Of those captives were four young Hebrew men. 
The names of those four young Hebrew men were Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And I want you to open your Bibles tonight as we have a look at this particular story here, to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. And as these four young men were taken back, they were taken from the city of God, they were taken from the Hebrew religion to the Babylonian religion, they found themselves challenged. They found themselves challenged to keep the faith that was taught them in their youth and in their childhood. Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah and Mishael were challenged with a decision. Will we worship the God of heaven or will we follow the gods of Babylon? And we find here in Daniel chapter 1, in verse 8, the Bible says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. You see, friends, there's a challenge there for every one of us as Christians. We find here Daniel. We could call him a young Christian man. He was in his late years of youth. And the Bible says that he determined in his heart that he would not defile himself with Babylon. And Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael made that decision as well. These four godly young men made a decision to be faithful to the God of heaven. And because of this, we find in verse 17 that God blesses these four young men. They were very bright and they were very committed to God. Verse 17 of Daniel chapter 1 says, As for these four children, it calls them children, but they were youth, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And notice these words. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. You see, God blessed these young men with wisdom, with understanding. But notice the words there, the Bible tells us, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. In other words, Daniel was given the gift of being a prophet. Daniel became a prophet of God. And of course, Daniel wrote the book of Daniel in the Bible. Daniel became a prophet of God. Now we pick up our story here in Daniel chapter 2. That's a bit of background of what took place, how Daniel and his friends got to Babylon. Now in Daniel chapter 2, we find that King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. We're going to find out this dream was given him by God himself. The Bible tells us here in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1, And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. Here we find Nebuchadnezzar. He goes to bed. He has a dream, and the dream terribly troubles him. We've all had those dreams before, friends, when you go to bed at night. You wake up in the morning, and you say, Oh, I've had a terrible dream. I've had a terrible dream. This is exactly what took place with King Nebuchadnezzar. So what the king did was he called in the wise men. And the wise men came in, the Bible says in Daniel 2 verse 4, The wise men said to the king, O king, live forever. Tell thy servant the dream, and we will show the interpretation. So they said, OK, king, you've had a terrible dream. You tell us what the dream is, and we will give you, or at least manufacture for you, an interpretation. Well, the king was getting a bit wise, I think, to his wise men, because the king decided to do something different this time. Bible tells us that the king would not tell the dream to the wise men. He wanted the wise men to tell him the dream and the interpretation. Maybe the king forgot the dream. I'm not sure. Sometimes we wake up in the morning, we've had a terrible dream, but we can't quite remember what it was. But anyway, the king tested his wise men. He said, wise men, you tell me the dream and you'll tell me the interpretation. Now, of course, the wise men couldn't do that. And in verse 10, the Bible says, the wise men said, there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Come on, king. There's not a man upon the face of the earth that can tell you what your dream was. We can tell you the interpretation, but you must tell us the dream. But because the wise men couldn't tell the dream, King Nebuchadnezzar was very, very angry. The Bible says in verse 12, for this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Here we find King Nebuchadnezzar. 
He's trying to get his wise men to tell him the dream. They can't do that. Because they can't do that, he starts to think, well, maybe these guys aren't so wise after all. And he gets so angry, he commands that all the wise men in his kingdom should be destroyed. Now, we discovered that Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael were given a blessing from God to be wise and to have wisdom. In fact, the Bible told us in Daniel chapter 1 that they were 10 times wiser than the wise men of Babylon. Now, if you were 10 times wiser than the wise men of Babylon, what would that make you? Friends, that would make you a wise man, wouldn't it? So when the king's commandment went forward to kill all the wise men of Babylon, that included Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And verse 13, the Bible says, And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Execute them was the command from King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, of course, you can just imagine Daniel and his friends. Someone comes to the door, says, all the wise men are to be slain. That includes you guys. Come on out. You're going to be executed. Poor old Daniel was thinking, well, what's going on? He finds out the story. He goes to the king and he asks the king for some time. He says, king, give us time and we will be able to tell you the dream and the interpretation. Now, of course, when they put that challenge out, the first thing that Daniel and his friends did is they went and they prayed. They prayed to the God of heaven that God would give them wisdom, that God would give them the dream. And that's exactly what God did. You know, friends, when you and I find ourselves in trouble, one of the best things for you and I to do is to pray. Isn't that right? We should pray to the God of heaven to give us wisdom, to give us knowledge, to know how to deal with situations in our life. Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, they took it to God. They prayed and God blessed them. God gives Daniel the same dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And he also gave him the interpretation. Well, the next day, Daniel comes in before the king. And in verse 26, the Bible says, The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? He sees Daniel come in. He says, Daniel, can you tell me the dream? Can you tell me the interpretation thereof? Now, notice what the Bible says here. Daniel doesn't just say, yes, I can tell you. Daniel tries to draw the attention of King Nebuchadnezzar to the God of heaven. In verse 27, it says this, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. He says, King, you've asked me to tell you the dream. You've asked me to tell you the interpretation of that dream. Can't your wise men, your soothsayers, your astrologers, your psychics, can't they tell you the dream? You see, friends, what Daniel's trying to do, he's trying to draw the attention of King Nebuchadnezzar to the God of heaven. He's saying, your wise men, they can't show you anything. Your psychics, your astrologers, your magicians, they can't tell you the dream. But friends, there is a God in heaven that can. There is a God in heaven that Daniel's trying to point King Nebuchadnezzar to. How is it with your life today, friend? Are you chasing the psychics and the mediums of today, going through astrology, going through gurus, going through whatever else, fortune tellers? The words of Daniel trying to point to Nebuchadnezzar that there is a God of heaven are applicable for you and I today. How often we find we go to the wise men of the world when the God of heaven, through his word, has given us the answers to what the future holds. Daniel continues on there in verse 28. He says, But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. He says there's a God in heaven that reveals the secrets of the future. And notice the words at the end of verse 28 there. It says, and what shall be in the latter days. Now we're starting to get a bit of a clue of what this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had is all about. The first point we must understand is that this dream is 
prophetic and it has to do with future times. In fact, the Bible said, Daniel said, it's to do with latter times. It reaches right down to the end of time. It reaches right down to the days in which you and I are living today. Now, of course, you're probably asking yourself the question, well, what was this dream? What was this dream all about? Let's read now because Daniel goes on to explain to King Nebuchadnezzar exactly what he saw in that dream. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Notice the words. Thou, O king, sawest and beheld a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon the feet that were of iron and clay and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and, the, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Here we find, he says to King Nebuchadnezzar, King, you saw this great image. In this great image, you saw different metals. You saw a stone that came and smote that image and destroyed it. You'll notice on the screen now, there's a bit of video animation to give us a, a visual picture of what this image was like. Daniel said to King Nebuchadnezzar, he said, King, in your vision you saw this great image. The head was of fine gold. The chest and the arms were of silver. The belly and the thighs were of brass. As you were watching, the legs were made of iron. And as they went down, we found that the feet were partly iron and partly clay. As you are watching, King, there was a stone that was cut out without hands. It came from nowhere. It smote the image. It ground the image to powder. And the, the powder was blown away on the wind like the chaff of a summer threshing floor. And that stone that was cut out without hands, it wasn't of a human origin, in other words, became a great mountain. And that mountain filled the whole earth. Now, when King Nebuchadnezzar heard this, he realized, he realized that this was the dream. It all came back. The king was excited. Yes, that's the dream. That's what I saw. But Daniel, what does it all mean? Well, first of all, friends, we already know that this dream is a dream that is prophetic. It's talking about future events. Because Daniel already said to us, he already told the king, it's dealing with the latter days. Or in other words, it extends right down to the latter days, or in other words, to the end of time. Now, what was this dream all about? What does it mean? Well, we don't have to wait long to find out because Daniel now very quickly begins to tell Nebuchadnezzar, who of course is very excited to find out what does it all mean. What does it really, really mean? We find in our very next words of Daniel the first clue to understand what this dream is really about. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 38, the Bible says this. He said, Thou art this head of gold. He said, King Nebuchadnezzar, you saw this great image, the head of gold, and so forth. He said, You, your kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon, he said, Thou art the head of gold. And what we find here, friends, is that God has given to us an outline of the kingdoms of this world right down to the day in which you and I live. It's given in the symbolic imagery of a metallic man. But as we decipher that now, we're going to find that God is talking about the nations and the kingdoms of this world. He says to King Nebuchadnezzar, Thou art the head of gold. Your kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon, is represented by that head of gold. And the kingdom of Babylon reigned from 605 to 539 B.C. But Daniel goes on now in verse 39 and he says this. 
And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Now this is where Daniel shocked King Nebuchadnezzar. He says, King Nebuchadnezzar, after thee shall arise another kingdom. Who was the next kingdom on the scene of history after the kingdom of Babylon? For those who are into a bit of history out there, we know that the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire, was next on the scene. Basically known as the Persian Empire because they were the stronger. It was like a coalition dual empire. But they reigned from 539 to 331 BC. Now the question we must ask ourselves is this. What happened to the kingdom of Babylon? Here we find King Nebuchadnezzar. He gets a shock. At the start, yes, I'm the kingdom of gold, the, the golden head. That's my kingdom. But he now realized he was just told that his kingdom would not last forever. He was just told by Daniel, his kingdom will not last forever. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. What happened to the kingdom of Babylon? Now, when King Nebuchadnezzar learned that his kingdom was not going to last forever, he was not happy. He was a very proud, a very arrogant man. He decided that his kingdom would last forever. He decided that, yes, the head of gold won't just be for a little while. I want my kingdom to last forever. In fact, archaeologists have dug up many things in the, uh, in the, in the area of, of ancient Babylon and they found some clay tablets written by Nebuchadnezzar himself upon which were inscribed these words. For the astonishment of men have I built this house. These portals for the astonishment of multitudes of people with beauty I adored may it last forever. You see, friends, the idea of Nebuchadnezzar was that his kingdom would last forever. It would never pass away. And when he heard this, that his kingdom would pass away, he decided to try to stop the prophetic sequence that God had just given us in the metallic man. And we find in Daniel chapter Three, and you can study that for your homework, we find there that Nebuchadnezzar decides to make the same image that he saw in his dream, but he made the whole image of gold, not just the head. The whole image was made of gold, and he commanded his whole empire to worship that image. But friends, when God prophesies something, it will come to pass. Man can do what he likes. God prophesied that the kingdom of Babylon, that golden kingdom, that magnificent empire, would not last forever. It would find an end somewhere. And friends, when God prophesies something, man can do what he likes. Man can try and change the world. But when God speaks, my friends, that will come to pass. When God says there will be another kingdom after Babylon, friends, God says that and that is what will take place. And in Daniel chapter 5, we find exactly what God said did take place. In Daniel chapter 5, we find that the reign of Babylon ended on October 13, 539 BC. 539 BC was the end of the Babylonian Empire. When Cyrus the Mede, he besieged Babylon, he destroyed Babylon exactly as the Bible said would take place. Now, as, way, uh, as a way of interest here, by way of interest here, we have some very interesting things said in the Bible about Babylon. Because before Babylon was destroyed, it was like the world power. It would be a bit like America today. It was the world power. But God prophesied many, many years before it was destroyed that it would be destroyed. And notice what God says in these verses in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 19 and 20. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. God says that in the, sometime in the future it will be destroyed, it will become like Sodom and Gomorrah who were totally destroyed. It won't be inhabited. Notice also what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 51, verse 37. Babylon shall become heaps. Jeremiah 51, verse 26. But thou shalt be desolate forever, saith the Lord. 
God has just been telling us about Babylon here. Before Babylon was destroyed, it will be desolate forever. It won't be dwelt in. It won't be rebuilt. It will be destroyed forever. Now, friends, when you're going to make statements like that, if you're going to make a statement like God has just made about Babylon, you would want to know what you're talking about. It would be a little bit like me standing up here tonight saying to you, saying, hey, I'm a prophet of God. And God has told me that Sydney will be destroyed, it will never be rebuilt, and it will never be inhabited. And if I said that, I am leaving myself open, big time, to be rejected as a prophet of God, aren't I? Because if Sydney wasn't destroyed in the first place, I'd be a false prophet. And if Sydney was destroyed and then rebuilt, I would be a false prophet, wouldn't I? But God said, 3,000 years ago, that Babylon was going to be destroyed. It would never be rebuilt. It would become a heap. And that's exactly what we find in Babylon today. If you would go to the ancient ruins of Babylon, which are in Iraq, just outside of Baghdad, you find that the ancient city of Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, as it was called in the Bible, is exactly what the Bible said it would be. It's a heap. It's ruined. It's desolate. It is destroyed and it's been that way for 2,000 and more years. It's exactly what God said would take place. You know, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand. You know, the Bible makes a claim, God makes a claim that He is God, that He declares things of the future, but He tells us of them in the past. He makes prophecy. He says, Babylon will become a heap. Babylon will be destroyed. And He allows that to stand for two, three thousand years to prove to the world that He is true. To prove to us that God's Word can be trusted now friends if you're going to make a statement like that you would want to know what you're talking about if i was going to make a statement like god has made there that babylon would be destroyed the greatest kingdom in the world at its time i'm leaving myself open but these are the statements that god puts in his word that give us the evidence that give us courage to believe that god is true because for three thousand years we find that god's word is true because babylon is still destroyed you know friends some people say Oh, the Bible, look, it's a good book. It's a good book of stories. It tells us some wonderful stories. Others say, look, it's a good book of morals. Others will say, look, it's a good book of history. But friends, it's all those but more than that. The Bible, friends, is a book that is divine. Only God would have the courage to say that Babylon would not be inhabited. It would not be built again. It would be desolate forever. No other book in the world, no other spiritual book from any religion in the world makes prophecies like the Bible. And the reason why it doesn't do that is because the Bible is the only book that God has written. The rest are false. God has put his signature in his book by making statements like this about Babylon that when we see it come to pass, we can have confidence that this is not just a book of stories or a book of morals or a book of history. It is a book that has the fingerprints of God from front to back inside it. But there have been men that have come along, men that have decided, I would like to prove the Bible wrong. And God has left himself open here because when he says that Babylon will never be built again, if somebody could come and build Babylon again, that would prove God wrong, wouldn't it? And there have been teams in the past that have decided to rebuild Babylon to prove that God is wrong to prove that we cannot trust his word and all of those people have failed one of those men that failed was a man by the name and we all know him very well Saddam Hussein you see Saddam Hussein believed that he was the great 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 many great grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar because where is Babylon where is the ancient city of Babylon? It's in Iraq, just near Baghdad, of course, of which Saddam Hussein was the king or the ruler. 
he decided he wanted to rebuild Babylon and set himself up as the new king, Nebuchadnezzar. There's some pictures on our screen here. We find that across the, the nation, he put up these big billboards picturing himself as the next king, Nebuchadnezzar, to rebuild the great empire of Babylon. There's a picture there of him looking into the face of old King Nebuchadnezzar. In the background is the, the, uh, the ancient city of Babylon and the Ishtar Gate, picturing himself as the new king. Nebuchadnezzar, wanting to prove God wrong, wanting to set himself up as the new king of Babylon. He tried to rebuild it. He tried to reestablish it. But something took place in the last few years that stopped the plans of Saddam Hussein. Now, what you see on the screen here is some photographs. You see, Saddam Hussein was well on the way to rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. These photographs on the screen were taken from a U.S army helicopter they were only on the internet for about two days i was told and a friend of mine got them before they were taken off and these photographs show us the pictures of what's taking well, what, what was taking place over there in iraq of saddam hussein rebuilding babylon you'll notice the walls are being rebuilt there you notice in the background on this particular photo there's a, a palace on top of the hill that was to be his new palace Around that palace was new gardens that was to be the new hanging gardens of Babylon. But Saddam Hussein's plan to defy the God of heaven, to prove the Bible wrong, to be the next King Nebuchadnezzar, got stopped suddenly by a man by the name of George W. Bush. And we all know the story of what's taken place over there in the last couple of years, how America has been at war with Iraq, and basically Iraq is decimated. Saddam Hussein's plans to be the next king of Babylon, to prove the word of God wrong, to raise up the kingdom of Babylon again, have been squashed and they will never, ever come to fruition because Saddam Hussein himself, of course, is now dead. Friends, when God speaks, it will come to pass. Man can plan to rebuild Babylon. Man can plan to do whatever he likes. But friends, when God speaks, it takes place. It's as simple as that. We can trust the Word of God. God has allowed Himself to be tested for two and a half thousand years and still Babylon has never been rebuilt. Let's get back to our study now. We find the story goes on as Daniel is interpreting the different parts of the image. There was the head of gold, Babylon, the chest and the arms of silver, Medo-Persia. And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 39... He says, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. He says, King Nebuchadnezzar, there'll be a third kingdom, the third kingdom of brass. What was the third empire that came onto the scene after the Medo-Persian Empire? And of course, we all know who it is. It's the kingdom of Greece. Greece reigned from 331 BC to 168 BC. And the reason why Greece came to power was because of a man, a famous man, by the name of Alexander the Great. He was a brilliant young general. He defeated Darius III of Persia at the Battle of Arbella. We are told in history that Alexander the Great had only 20,000 men. Darius III had one million, and they won the battle. He was a brilliant general. And by the age of about 30 years of age, Alexander the Great had conquered the then known world. He conquered the world. It was unheard of for such a, a, a young general, such a powerful young general to conquer so much land. And he basically conquered the world by the age of about 30. But you know, friends, there's a story about Alexander the Great. After he conquered the world, we're told, he stood upon the shores of India as he was standing upon the shores of India, he was looking out to sea. As he was looking out to sea, some of his generals that were standing behind him a little ways noticed that as he was standing there looking out to sea, that Alexander the Great began to weep. Now, if you know the history of Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great, friends, he doesn't weep. And as his generals were watching this, one of them mustered up enough courage to go up to Alexander the Great and ask him why he was weeping. His general came up. His general said, uh, Alexander, you, you, you've, just, you've just conquered the world. Why are you weeping? 
His reply was this. He says, I have just conquered the entire world. I have the world at my feet. He says, I have nothing left to live for. He'd conquered the world, friends, and he said, I have nothing left to live for. You see, friends, when you and I try and conquer the world, we find this world leaves us empty. Alexander the Great was able to conquer the world, but he couldn't conquer himself. His life was empty. His life was meaningless. And by the age of about 33 years of age, sadly, Alexander the Great, the one who conquered the world, couldn't conquer himself when he drank himself to death. Have you ever felt like Alexander the Great, friend? Trying to conquer the world, trying to get as much wealth, as much pleasures, as much toys and possessions as possible. You know, the world today, people are trying to conquer the world, aren't they? They're trying to make the money. They're trying to be rich and famous and powerful. But friends, how many times we see those who finally get to the top of the ladder, finally conquer the world, as it were, find out, as Alexander the Great did, that their life is empty, that their life is meaningless, that there is nothing left to live for. And just like Alexander the Great, they turn to alcohol. They turn to drugs. And many of them die at an early age. Friends, nothing satisfies in this world outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, friends, I was one of those people once trying to make money, fame, fortune, trying to be strong, trying to be powerful. And I learned that nothing satisfies other than Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter, friend, how large your sandcastle is on the beach. The tide always comes in and takes it away. Today, people are building great mansions. They're building great empires. But friends, the tide will always come in and take it away. The only thing you can hang on to when that tide comes in is Jesus Christ. He will give you the peace the satisfaction and the longings of the human heart. He is the only one, my friend, that will satisfy your life. But now Daniel goes on. Daniel goes on in verse 40 and he says this, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Here we find head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass. Now we're down to the legs of iron. And Daniel says there'll be a fourth kingdom. Strong as iron. Of course, we all know that fourth kingdom was the great empire of Rome. Rome reigned from 168 BC to around 476 AD. Rome was a ruthless nation. It ruled the world, as it were, with a rod of iron. God depicted Rome with legs, as legs of iron. And she did rule the world as a rod of iron. Her Caesars called themselves gods. They demanded worship and obedience from all men. She was the largest and the most long-lived of all those four world empires. And she controlled the world in the days when Jesus Christ himself came to this world. Now the big question is this. Who conquered Rome? Here we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, each one conquering each other. But the big question, friends, is this. Who conquered the kingdom of Rome? Now if you were a man... And you were simply writing this out. You would say one empire comes and another empire comes and another empire comes. And when you got to Rome, you would probably say, and another empire came and conquered Rome. But when we ask ourselves the question of who conquered Rome, from history we know the answer is that no one conquered Rome. Rome simply conquered itself. It destroyed itself. Notice what the Bible says here in Daniel chapter 2, verse 41 as uh, Daniel keeps going forward here. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Here we find in our metal man, we're down now into the feet, and we know the feet were made of iron and clay. And Daniel interprets that. He says the kingdom will be divided. And friends, this is exactly what took place in history. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. But Rome was never conquered. It just conquered itself. It just fell to pieces. And the kingdom was divided. We find from the fallen empire of Rome, the divided nations of this, this world 
really have their foundation. Today, we have what we call modern Europe. And really, Rome broke up into what we call Europe today. That's where it came from. Rome divided. It fell apart. The iron fibers of this giant empire, which had ruled for nearly 600 years, just fell to pieces through corruption, through luxury, through greed, through moral decay. Rome lost its stability. It lost its strength. It became an easy prey for barbarian tribes. And they came in from the north, those Germanic tribes, and they began to just settle into the area of Rome, the Roman Empire. And by the year 476, when Emperor Augustus was deposed, Rome had been divided, historians tell us, into 10 segments. And that's very, very interesting because we find on this image the feet of iron and clay and the 10 toes. Those 10 toes represent those 10 original divisions of the Roman Empire of which it broke up into. And many of those divisions are still with us today. Those original 10 divisions were the Alamanni, the Burgundians, the Franks, the Lombards, the Saxons, the Suvi, the Visigoths, the Heruli Vandals and the Ostrogoths. Now seven of those powers are with us today. The Alamanni are the Germans, the Burgundians, the Swiss, the Franks, the French, the Lombards, the Italians, the Saxons, the English, the Suvi is Portuguese, Portuguese, Visigoth, the Spanish. But three of those powers were destroyed. The Heruli Vandals and the Ostrogoths, they are extinct. And we're going to find out more about that in our up and coming lecture. But modern, the modern nations of Europe today really developed from the disintegration of the Roman Empire. Some were weak, some were strong. But notice as it, go, as it goes on now, what uh, Daniel has to say in verse 43. Talking about the feet and the toes of iron and clay, he says, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Ever since 476, when those, those original ten tribes were put in place, or were in place. Many have come along trying to weld the world back together, but they've never succeeded. Why? It's because God said they shall not cleave one to another. The same as iron and clay don't mingle together and become strong, the divided nations of, of Europe, the divided nations of the world would never become strong. They would never mingle together. They will not cleave one to the other. The Bible tells us that men would come along and try and weld the world back together, have a world empire. But friends, it's never taken place, and it never will take place as such, because the Bible says that they shall not cleave one to the other. God said, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, then there would be the divided nations of this world. They would not cleave one to another. And people have tried. As we go back through history, we find that people tried to get the Roman Empire back together. There was people like uh, King Charlemagne, the Holy Roman Empire, tried to gather the world back together. He failed. Richard I, or better known as Richard the Lionheart, he tried to have a kingdom where it was like the old Roman Empire. He failed. Of course, there was a man we all know fairly well, I think, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. What was his goal? What was his wars all about? It was all about gathering the world, gathering Europe back into one nation. You know, Napoleon Bonaparte actually said this. He said, I wanted to found a European system. There would have been but one people throughout Europe. Europe would soon have become one nation. People trying to gather it all back together, but God said, they shall not cleave one to the other. There will be divided kingdoms of the world. And friends, what God said is exactly what we see take place. Another person that tried to get peace and, and, and bring the empire back together was Queen Victoria. You know, in Daniel 2 verse 43, we read just before, it said, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now, what does that mean? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. What that basically means is intermarriage between different nations. And Queen Victoria, some of the kings and queens of England were very good at trying to 
bring the empire back together, to bring the different nations back together by intermarrying their sons and daughters with other kings and queens and princes and so forth of other, other nations. Exactly what the Bible said would do, would take place. They'll mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to the other. There's a statement from a book here, which I uh, appreciate by Uriah Smith. It says, To avert future conflicts, benevolent rulers resorted to the expedient of intermarriage to ensure peace until by the opening of the 20th century, it was asserted that every ranking hereditary ruler of Europe was related to the British royal family. Mingling the seed together, trying to get peace. But friends, we find <clears throat> that just as prophecy said would take place, they are not united together. Then we come a bit closer to home. World War I, what was it all about really? Gathering a world empire together, wasn't it? Kaiser Wilhelm tried to gather the world under his control. A few years later, another German came along, Adolf Hitler. World War II, what was Hitler's goal? Why was Hitler trying to destroy the world? Simply because he wanted to, to uh, control the world, wasn't that right? To bring in the Third Reich, to bring in that, that thousand years of peace, to have a super race have a super empire but he too failed as he tried to discredit without realizing it bible prophecy friends when god says the nations of the world will be divided they shall not cleave one to the other friends when god speaks it will come to pass in fact there's a story told about adolf hitler he had a young maid working for him and this young maid happened to be a christian and this young maid knew exactly what Daniel chapter 2 had to say. And one day, halfway through the war, she sat Hitler down and said, Adolf, you are not going to win the war. Because the Bible says they shall not cleave one to the other. And when she explained Daniel chapter 2 to Adolf Hitler, as the story goes, Adolf stood to his feet, stamped his feet and said, No, 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 it doesn't fit into my plans. But friends, it doesn't matter what our plans are. When God has already spoken, when God has already outlined the history of this world, man can do what he likes, but it will be fruitless if it's against the word of God. And the very next day, Adolf Hitler wrote this. He said, To my people, we do not need anything from God. We do not ask him for anything except that he may let us alone. We want to fight our own wars with our own guns without God. You see, friends, Adolf Hitler had a plan that was opposite to the plan of God. And he said, God, we don't want you in our plan. But friends, we know from history that also Adolf Hitler totally failed in his attempts to bring the empire back together, to have a world empire, to be the controlling dictator of, a, of the Third Reich. And, of course, he died a lost man as well. But even today, as history has told us time and time and time again that to bring it all back together into one has failed. We find today there is still a great push in our world to gather the empire back together. We have things like the United Nations. What is the United Nations really for? It's there to bring peace, I suppose, in some ways. But really it's to do what? Gather everybody back together. Isn't that right? We have things like the European economic community. They can't bring them back together by wars and so forth. Now it's being tried by money, finances, economy. But the Bible says, friends, that they shall not cleave one to the other. They will be the divided nations of this world till the end. They may come together in the future, as we'll find out, and have a purpose of coming together and uniting together on a certain point, but they will be the divided nations of this world till the end. What have we learned tonight? Let's review. Head of gold, Babylon, chest in the arms of silver, Medo-Persia, the belly and the thighs of brass, Greece, legs of iron, Rome, the feet and the toes of iron and clay, the divided kingdoms of Europe, which of course have spread out to this world. But the prophecy went on. What happens next as Daniel is still explaining 
to King Nebuchadnezzar about this prophecy. Daniel 2 verse 44, the Bible says, And in the days of these kings, in other words, the divided nations of this world, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. You see, friends, this is a prophecy that affects every one of us on this earth. Because we are right down at the end of this prophecy. And the Bible says, at the end of this prophecy, in the toenails of time, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. God will have a kingdom at the end of this prophecy. This tells us, friends, where we are in time. You see, friends, this world we live in today will not always be the way it is. God is going to set up his own world empire. And this world empire, this kingdom called the kingdom of heaven, will last forever. Nobody else is going to come and overthrow it. The kingdom of God will last forever. All through the Bible, especially the New Testament, it talks about this kingdom that God will set up. A kingdom where there will be peace, joy, eternal life and happiness. The kingdom of heaven as it's known by. And we are living in the very day when that kingdom will be set up. The kingdom of heaven. You know, friends, as we look at this tonight, as we go through the stream of time, as we see how God has outlined the kingdoms of this world, how we've been able to decipher what the imagery really means, and we come right down to the end of time, and God says, in the days of these kings, I will set up a kingdom. It will last forever. It will destroy the kingdoms of this world. You know, friends, the great question we must ask ourselves tonight is this. Is will you and I be part of God's kingdom? Will you be a citizen in the kingdom of God? Will you be part of the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom that Jesus Christ is soon to set up on this earth? Because that great rock that comes out of nowhere and destroys the image is Jesus Christ. All through the Bible, the Bible refers to Jesus Christ and God as the rock of our salvation. That rock will destroy the kingdoms of this world, the sadness, the suffering and the sin, and it will set up a kingdom where peace and joy and life will reign forever. And the question is, friend, will you be part of that kingdom? You know, God is extending his hand to you and I tonight. He's saying, I want you to be part of that kingdom. You know, when Jesus Christ was dying upon the cross of Calvary, the Bible tells us there were two thieves that were crucified with him. One of those thieves on one side began to mock and laugh and scorn, where the other thief recognized that Jesus Christ was the Savior of the world. He recognized that this man dying upon the cross was the Son of God. And he said to Jesus, he said, Lord, remember me, notice these words, when you come into your kingdom. He recognized that Jesus Christ would have a kingdom. He knew he would have a kingdom. He was dying. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The Bible tells us in Luke 23, verse 42, that Jesus looked at this thief and he said, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. You see, friends, God is calling to us tonight. God is asking you and I, would you like to be part of that kingdom? If we would just be like the thief, if you and I would just say like the thief, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus would say, thou shalt be with me in paradise. He wants each one of us to be there, friends. He has given us this particular prophecy, which is an amazing prophecy, outlining the kingdoms, the major kingdoms of this world to the day in which you and I live, which tells us that we are living in the toenails of time and he's asking us to be part of his eternal kingdom. You know, Daniel finishes with these words. In Daniel 2, verse 45, he says this to the king. Notice his words. He says, The dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. Two and a half thousand years ago, Daniel says to the king, The dream is certain, the interpretation thereof is sure, and we can look back two and a half thousand years and say that's exactly right. The dream was certain, the interpretation was sure, and we are right down now at the end of this world. Friends, just as surely as there was a Babylon, just as surely as there was a Medo-Persia, just as surely as there was a Greece and a Rome, just as surely as there was the, is the divided kingdoms of this world, so too will God set up his eternal kingdom. Everything in this prophecy has taken place except one point, 
Jesus Christ coming to this world to set up his eternal kingdom that he wants you and I to be part of. You know, friends, we've noticed tonight from this prophecy, I believe, that the world we live in is not in the hands of human beings. Even though there can be chaos and disaster on every side, God has shown us his hand is in the hand of history. He is the one turning the pages of the history of this world. And you and I should be able to, through this one particular prophecy, have a greater confidence and trust in the word of God and in God himself. You and I can rest securely in the knowledge that God is in control. Now tonight we have seen we are living in the day when God will set up his kingdom. But exactly how close are we to that time? How close are we to this taking place? Maybe it'll be another thousand years away. Who knows? Do we know? Can we tell if the second coming of Christ and this eternal kingdom being set up is close at hand? Can you and I tell if we are closer? Well, tomorrow night in our next lecture, we are going to see that we are right at the end of time. Our next meeting is entitled Time Running Out. What are world events telling us? Why are there so many disasters? Is time running out 